And I'll introduce myself, I'm sure, because uh, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK. Right. Let's see if it'll let me share my screen. There we go. OK. You should be able to see my PowerPoint. Is that visible to everyone? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, and please interrupt me with questions. This is, uh, you know, this is not a, anything like a formal talk. Raja, are you muted for anybody else? Is, is Raja muted for anybody else but me? I can hear Raja fine. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to log out and log back in. I can't hear you, Raja. Sorry. Uh, no to worries. No worries. Um, yeah. So I thought I would uh, structure this like a, a science talk and uh, talk about the background motivation before going into, um, you know, going, before going into the work I've been involved in with many people, many collaborators. Um, I'm going to wait for a moment to, uh, you know, Nia's was having some difficulty. So let's see. Um, okay, but since it's being recorded, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead. Um, so you normally start a science talk by talking about, you know, why you, um, you know, why you took a spectrum of a supernova or why you uh, took an image of, you know, a galaxy or why you did a time series photometry or modeling of a transiting exoplanet. You talk about the bigger picture and the motivation. So I, you know, it makes sense to, for me to start uh, by talking about that. Um, most of what I'll talk about today involves bringing science research from universities, you know, from UC Santa Cruz, but also from other universities to populations of people young people generally, who wouldn't otherwise have experienced this research. And uh, my, uh, my motivation for doing this is because I had very limited access to such opportunities when I was in elementary, middle, and high school. I had some opportunities and I, I, I'll, you know, I'll point them out along the way because there were so few and uh, far between that it's easy to point them out. Um, but I ended up, um, you know, completely by chance getting into a, a grad school, getting into a few grad schools and um, found myself completely lost um, when I was first plunged into research. This is something that became, you know, doing research became a big part of my, uh, has been a big part of my professional uh, life. But I remember distinctly how difficult it was entering grad school and making the transition from classroom style learning, classroom style problem solving to a research mindset. And uh, because I didn't have the preparation as a school student, um, I, it made me more keenly aware of um, how beneficial it was, or it would have been for me to have had that experience or how beneficial it is for uh, people who have that this kind of experience in high school. So that's sort of my motivation for this. And I'll, I'll talk about uh, three uh, initiatives. One is, you know, this, you see the names right here, Starry Starry Night and Native Sky Watches is a collaboration. Um, and uh, Python and Research is something that Amanda and Kevin and a few others at UCSC have been involved in with me. And I'll talk about the science internship program, which again has involved uh, several people at Santa Cruz. Um, the CREST initiatives um, we came up with this uh, last year, this really this set of initiatives. It's not one, it's an umbrella of initiatives. And um, let me see if I can advance my slides. There we go. Uh, the CREST initiatives, uh, you know, very proud of this logo. It, uh, you know, it's supposed to look like the crest of a wave, but it's also meant to be the letter C-R-E-S-T, if you can read them in the, you know, in the outline of the wave. And it stands for creating equity in STEM or really creating equity in STEAM. Um, and um, what we, uh, what, when we started thinking about this about a year ago, you know, um, shortly after the 
after George Floyd's murder. And I know this is in the, you know, I know his trial and the recent shooting are in the news. And I'm certainly reminded of, uh, you know, what my thinking was, what my colleagues' thinking was a year ago when, uh, when we launched these initiatives. Now, it's not fair to say we launched those initiatives then. We really launched this umbrella then because many of the initiatives were already in play. And the initiatives are listed here, the logos for many of them. And I'm going to focus on three of them. You know, so the science internship program, Starry Starry Night, and Python and Research. But since I'm going to focus on those three, let me just briefly mention what the others are. The science internship program uh, I'll talk about. But so TSIP stands for teachers, bringing high school teachers into the science internship program. And the CSIP is the same, but bringing community college students into the science internship program. We've launched a very successful buddies program where near peer mentoring students who are just, you know, who are still in high school and are slightly older than the students who are going this, through this research experience for the first time, act as buddies and sort of hold the hands of slightly, slightly younger high school students. Um, you know, we, we've been looking at trajectories of students who've gone through this program and their storytelling is really important for others who are going to follow this path. Uh, the P2C2N is peer-to-peer -peer college and career counseling. It's a network that we've, um, we're starting to build up. And the Sphere Network is a network of programs around the, around the world that engage high school students in research. I'm very proud of this acronym. Sphere stands for STEM programs for high schoolers engaging in research early. And it has, has the right name. It has, it has the right shape, Sphere, because it really engages programs from around the world. Uh, so Starry, Starry Night is something that um, really came out of COVID. Um, the fact that we can use telescopes or have to use telescopes from home, can't actually go out to observatories, can't go out even to our campus to use the remote observing room, uh, meant that certain innovations had to take place, technical innovations had to take place for us to use our computers to control telescopes on mountaintops, you know, whether it's Lake on Mount Hamilton or Keck on Mauna Kea. Those are the two telescopes I've been focused on. And we started this in the fall. We said, if we're going to do this, we, you know, uh, professional researchers are going to use this telescope and uh, we're going to do this each from our living rooms and we're going to connect through Zoom. We may as well have others eavesdrop and watch us do this. You know, it's like, um, it's even better than, you know, walking through a hospital and looking through a glass window to see the surgeon operating. Uh, it's even better than that because the surgeon is also behind the glass window and they're operating remotely. Um, you know, and it's, it's not meant to be orchestrated. It's meant to be real, raw, uncut, you know, reality science, science in progress, not, not something prepared or rehearsed for the eavesdroppers. You know, it's like watching a, a marine biologist with a GoPro camera, you know, live feed from that. You know, there's a chance that the shark will turn around and eat the marine biologist. And we want that, you know, we want that reality to be part of this uh, process. You know, astronomy is a much safer science. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about Starry Starry Night and a, and a collaboration that I, I, I'm very excited about. You know, my, one of my collaborators may join near the end of this call. She's in a dreaded faculty meeting at her home institution right now. We all love faculty meetings. Uh, but she, she said she'd drop and uh, you know, join near the end of the hour. The second thing I'll talk about is something that um, involves teaching Python, but in the context of, of research, something that uh, has been going on for a few years and really started at Santa Cruz, started with, um, you know, with a couple of my PhD students. And then finally, I'll talk about the science internship program. Um, so, um, you know, moving forward with Starry Starry Night, this collaboration that uh, really started about 10 weeks ago, early February, um, is something that I feel utterly privileged to be part of, you know, it's somebody else's life's work. And they've sort of agreed to take me take me in. And it's really through their kindness, that they've agreed to take, take, me, um, take me on. There's no reason they needed to. They could have just said, go away. We're doing this work anyway. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but, but before I go into each of these three things, you know, Starry Starry Night, uh, PR, and SIP, I want to put this into a little bit of context. Um, and this is context I've been thinking about now for the last few years. And feel free to chime in and you know, either tweak that these, this context or um, give me an opposing viewpoint. I'm completely open to this. Okay, so the, the context I'm going to give you is a ramp. 
is a ramp that involves a young person with very limited experience in STEM going from that mindset to, to becoming a confident researcher tackling open-ended problems. No, it, it takes quite a transition to go from one state to the other. I've experienced this myself, so no, it's not, a, not an easy transition to make. So I want to talk, I think of it as a ramp, an on-ramp to the, to the freeway of STEAM research. Okay, so this on-ramp, in my mind, looks something like this. Before I go into the details, you know, it starts with access, enrichment, exposure. It then involves some skills building on the part of the student. It then goes to controlled research projects that finally goes into open-ended research projects. So I'm going to say a little bit about each of these. And this is sort of something I've made up. So don't take this too seriously. And, you know, you'll see other examples of this ramp that are much better. Um, for me, the access enrichment exposure personally, when I was a kid, happened when I, not in the classroom, but it happened when, you know, a famous mathematician walked into our elementary school classroom. This is someone who could, who was known as the human computer. She could, you know, you could tell her my birthday, you know, I'm 25 years old and my birthday is the 29th of November, 1961. And without batting an eyelid, she would tell you what day of the week that was. Uh, when you were born. You know, she could do things like that. There's a recent Netflix movie made about her. I, I watched it because I remember that person, uh, you know, not, not the actor, but the person, the actual person who did this. So for me, that was uh, uh, access to the person who was this STEM whiz. Um, for me, it also happened virtually. I, uh, I got access to someone named David Attenborough, brother of Richard Attenborough, Sir Richard Attenborough. David Attenborough created a, a video series called Life on Earth. And while I couldn't travel to the corners of the globe, I could travel to the British Council, the city I was in, and I could watch this many hour, many segment movie series of David Attenborough going around the globe and really telling us about evolutionary biology. You know, I, I should have been a biologist by that because, because of what, um, you know, what I learned there and what I learned about just the thrill of someone uh, doing this research. You know, fortunately, I'd, you know, I'd been to a planetarium before this, so I had already, uh, you know, stars were already embedded in my brain somehow. So it's meeting the people, it's engaging in the, pro or learning about the process, not engaging, learning It's generally a passive activity and it happens at scale, you know, science museums, planetariums, you know, the Cosmos series, whether it's, you know, Carl Sagan's or Neil deGrasse Tyson's version of it, in my case, David Attenborough's Life on Earth series. This happens at scale, but it's passive. And, uh, you know, it, it, but it breaks a certain mold when this happens. You know, and science is reported in newspapers and magazines, but you see the end result. You don't see the people in the process. And this gets you to the people in the process. But to engage for a high school student or a elementary school student to engage, they need to learn some skills. You know, it could be pipetting skills. It could be learning, a, running a PCR machine. But to participate, you need some skills. And probably learning to program a computer is the most vital modern day research skill. And these skills, again, are taught at scale. You know, I think of the Khan Academy and MOOCs in general uh, are really doing a wonderful job of, of, of reaching. It's not, this is, you know, it's not the case that every kid everywhere has access, but uh, this is being offered on very large scales. Um, then I come to something called what I'm going to call controlled research projects. And I see Bruce Margon in the, uh, in the Zoom room, and Bruce and I have co-taught Cosmos together on campus. And this would be an example where you take students through research projects that are no longer publishable because it's all, they've already been done, they've been published, but you can take a student down that path. And you know, any, any path that involves a complicated technical journey has twists and turns, has you know, sharp pitfalls, et cetera. But uh, it's controlled in the sense that you, you as a mentor can control the amount of information you give your students. You can tell them, watch out, there's this you know, big turn in the road, there's a big cliff here, or watch out for this pitfall when you're trying to analyze this color magnitude diagram data. A good example would be, yes, literally taking CMD information or photometry from the Hubble for a globular cluster and say, okay, go plot this up, plot up some isochrones and figure out the age, distance, and metallicity of this globular cluster. Now, it's already been done, people have published this, but when a kid is doing this, 
um, they can get guidance from you or not. And what they learn along the way is um, they're navigating a researcher's journey, but a journey that's already been taken. That's the important thing, a journey that's already been taken. So you can control, you know the path, you can control the amount of guidance. And finally, there's open-ended research where the mentor hasn't traveled this path. So there's trial and error, there's productive failure. And this is very difficult to offer at scale. This is something where mentors tend to work with small groups of students. And, um, you know, uh, several of you have been involved in projects like this in, you know, Roots Astro 9 class, for example, in the Lamarck program, for example, um, in SIP. Uh, these are uh, projects where you're solving the problem of the students and, and the mentor are solving the problem for the first time. Okay, so with this in mind, I'm going to Starry Starry Night and the collaboration is very much about access enrichment and exposure. The PR tutorial I'll talk about is about research skills building and controlled projects. And the SIP program I'll talk about at the end is about open-ended research. So really straddling all four of these uh, steps in the STEM on ramp. Um, so I'm really delighted about this collaboration. Um, it's something, uh, the Native Sky Watchers program was launched by Annette Lee, who I, as I said, might join this call a little later. Um, and you know, here's, here's a you know, screenshot from their website. It's been going on for a few years and they have a, a you know, wonderful NASA funded partnership um, going on and I'll say a little bit more and Annette hopefully will say a little bit more about this. And if you look at the, this beautiful website, Annette is an astronomer and artist. Um, and um, I'll say a little bit more about her when I introduce the people behind this. Um, but it's really at the intersection of art, science, culture, social justice. Um, these are workshops that are aimed at the revitalization of indigenous astronomy where indigenous is defined in the broadest possible way. And I'm using Annette's uh, words, so, um, you know, in the broadest possible way. And you'll see in the lower right that uh, there's a new project, We Are Stardust, which is a collaboration with UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Annette put together, in addition to this beautiful graphic you see at the top of the webpage, she put together this beautiful graphic, which is a, an indigenous drawing on the right, a picture of the Milky Way on the left, you know, one is meant to be a representation of the other. And, uh, you know, some modern day telescopes that are used to study um, the Milky Way. And we are calling this Fear Stardust because the theme is very much about the galaxy human connection of, you know, chemical evolution and how our origin um, is in Stardust. Um, the people behind the uh, Native Sky Watchers, the people I've been most um, directly connected uh, to, um, thanks to Nia for making an introduction to Annette, or Annette Lee. She's a professor um, in the astronomy department at St. St. Cloud State University in uh, uh, Minneapolis. Um, Jurita Holbrook, so the U University of Edinburgh, and Andrea Medina, who's, at, uh, who's a UC colleague at, the, at UC Santa Barbara. They're in different departments. They're not all in the astronomy departments. Uh, they're in different departments, but I have to, if I didn't mention this connection, my story wouldn't be complete. My journey, um, without knowing it, my journey to connect with Native Sky Watchers started over a quarter of a century ago. Jurita Holbrook was a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. She was a PhD student in the mid nineties when I joined the faculty, I joined the faculty in 94. Jurita got her PhD in 1997, I was on her thesis committee. Uh, she worked on the interstellar medium. Her thesis advisor was Dave Rank. And um, years later, when Jurita was um, in South Africa, at the University of the Western Cape, she was on Annette Lee's thesis committee. So in some sense, Jurita, uh, Annette, Jurita, and I are three generations, scientific generations, connected through thesis committees. We're not, um, you know, I'm not Jurita's thesis advisor. Jurita is not Annette's thesis advisor, but we are connected. And, and Andrea Medina is a recent connection uh, through, through Annette. Um, and something beautiful that I've learned from Annette, and something beautiful that Annette has learned from her elders, is something called two eyed seeing. I don't want to uh, misrepresent it. So I'm going to put it up verbatim here from the Native White Sky Watchers and Two-Eyed Seeing website. Um, and this is the idea. This is the idea that Two-Eyed Seeing 
is learning to see from one eye with the strength of indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strength of Western knowledges and ways of knowing. But the most important thing we're reminded is to use both of these eyes for the benefit of all. I've uh, given you a reference there. Um, and again, this is taken directly. I've learned this from Annette and Annette has uh, ascribed this to her elders. Um, so in this collaboration where we are using, uh, when we are on the Lick and Keck telescopes, my research team is on there. Um, we are, by having students and teachers eavesdrop, we are serving as one of the eyes. And we are, uh, I, I can tell you for myself, I'm learning to see through the, the other eye, one that I've been um, disconnected from. You know, the indigenous, indigenous knowledge um, is something that I have been disconnected from. So this is certainly, the learning is taking place in uh, all directions. Uh, these are some beautiful graphics that Annette has put together. You see the artist side of her. These are two eyed seeing events that have been happening already, again, through an, a NASA collaboration. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the drawing on the right is, um, is Jasmina's drawing from, um, this is uh, Jurita's daughter's drawing. Um, I have videos now, we've already started this, of children who have taken part in this. And it's really, uh, it's giving agency to students to say that uh, you don't have to shed your cultural heritage to take part in this. In fact, you're enriched by your cultural heritage in ways that other students who are part of this may not be. Um, you're, you have this cultural heritage, be proud of it, bring it. And it's really telling a story in three parts. It's the, as we said, Western knowledge, indigenous knowledge, but also bringing your own story uh, as a child into the into the mix. So there are these wonderful videos that we've already started to see of um, students taking agency, middle school and high school students taking agency in this process, um, going through these two, three stories, constructing, being the producers of content uh, to inspire other students. All right, uh, this is all I have for um, this collaboration between Native Skywatchers and Two-Eyed Seeing, um, it's literally started in February. We've had some sessions in March. Uh, we're uh, preparing for sessions in April and May. So this is very much ongoing, brand new. Uh, but I'd love for you to get involved. You know, many of you on this call get telescope time and or do your research in ways that can be shared through video, um, I'd be happy to uh, explore ways to collaborate. You know, for example, one of my collaborators in, um, in an institute in India, uh, he's an astronomer, but he's really moved into outreach now. He got, um, he connected to a grad student who works with an electron microscope. And as she was using the electron microscope to look at certain, um, you know, certain specimens, um, she had this on video and people were zooming in to see in real time, you know, what, what this graduate student was looking at through an electron microscope. So it's certainly expandable beyond astronomy. I'm already seeing it expanded beyond astronomy. I have no intention of keeping this confined to astronomy. All right, moving on to something completely different and something that, um, again, students at Santa Cruz have been quite strongly involved in. Well, I mean, they started it. Um, is uh, something called PR. You know, PR is a Hindi word for love. Uh, if you watched a Bollywood movie, you can't avoid the word PR. But in this case, it stands for Python and Research. And it's a free online programming tutorial. There are many pre programming tutorials out there. What's special about this is it's actually embedded uh, within a scientific research article. And we've used this, um, uh, I think, effectively in um, a Roots astronomy class. and. Um, and the fact that it's being offered by the people who wrote, who were involved in the research article or are doing research that's aligned with that is a very meaningful part of that experience for students. Uh, we don't have a website for it, but the URL you see is actually a Google Doc that contains much of the information. Okay, uh, what is it? You know, so you know, here's the paper. This is based on one paper. We are now building um, modules based on computational biology papers. You know, we meaning I'm not doing this, but a grad student, of, a postdoc in uh, the biomedical engineering department is actually doing something. And he's doing this in three languages, in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. He's originally from Brazil. So he's taking a computational biology paper 
just like this astronomy paper, and he's breaking it down to create a tutorial. So this is a real paper on the Andromeda galaxy published um, six years ago, and almost to the day I, I see. And uh, you know, it has plots like color magnitude diagrams, it has spectra, and it's published by Claire Dorman, who is a PhD student in, uh, you know, in our department. And, um, but the essence of this is something that can be translated to other papers and other disciplines. So uh, what you do is you, you take the code that was used to do the end stage analysis for the paper. If it's well documented, if it's well commented code, what you do is you strategically remove certain lines of code. You don't remove the comment, you remove the code. And the participants who take part in the tutorial have to restore those lines. And of course, there are many ways of, um, of you know, getting the task done uh, in most programming languages. And so far we, you know, we started offering this in person uh, about a, probably a you know, better part of a decade ago when Claire was a graduate student. We, we went to an all girls school and we were teaching this in person. Um, and then um, I guess uh, two and a half years ago, November, 2018, we started doing this online and um, that was mostly Emily Cunningham and Amanda um, um, doing this work. And, uh, you know, and there was a sudden spike in the interest level, uh, just like there was a spike in COVID-19, uh, there was a spike in the interest level and it coincided with COVID-19. I think people got used to online learning. They saw that in-person opportunities were limited. And we went from getting a you know, about 100 people sign up for each of these sessions to over 800 people signing up. And we offered this in September, October last year. And, you know, and there were participants from 11 different African countries, uh, five countries in Latin America and, you know, other countries around the globe. Um, so it was really heartening to see that a lot of this, you know, hard work of outreach and, you know, building trust uh, around the world had paid off that uh, students were really signing up to do these things. And we've been offering this as two, two, hour, two, three hour sessions. So this is very much about, you know, just dipping your toe in the water, maybe wading into the shallow end of the pool. This is not diving into the deep end because it's, it's a limited time commitment. It's a limited amount of effort just to see what programming looks like, what astronomy research looks like. Um, you know, you make plots, you, you can change the formula. You know, there's a snippet of code from one of the tutorials. This, is, um, this, this part of the code is not embedded in the, uh, in the research article. This is just standard Python making three lines, right? Uh, different colors, you know, putting in a, a legend, etc. cetera. Now, um, the people, uh, Claire Dorman was a PhD student. She graduated in 2015. Uh, after she graduated, this was really uh, championed by Emily Cunningham, another PhD student. And uh, after Emily graduated, it's been Amanda who's been uh, really uh, carrying the um, uh, carrying this forward. Um, there's been other others involved, Cesar and uh, Kevin from our department, one of the high school students I work with uh, from India. She just gotten into college, very excited about getting into all kinds of fancy colleges, but she was a mentor. This high school student, an 18 year old high school student was a mentor and our oldest participant was 72 years old. So it was nice to see this sort of reversal of, uh, uh, you know, breaking some of these age barriers. Um, and finally, I'm gonna say a little bit about the science internship program. This has been my baby. This is something, uh, well, my baby is actually on the far right of this picture. That's my daughter who took part in this program a, a couple of um, couple of summers. Uh, but it's something that started very small, and um, and I blame two people for starting this. One is Sandy. One is Sandy Faber, and the other person is a teacher in a high school. Um, that um, Sandy's older daughter attended. This is the Harker School in San Jose. Uh, Robin was uh, in middle school at the Harker School and the science department head, Anita Chetty, had reached out to Sandy. This would have been in the mid 2000s, had reached out to Sandy to say that, you know, we're a very academically oriented school. You're a famous astronomer. I know you because you're, you're an alumna, uh, you're a parent of a Harker alumna. Um, I know you're a famous astronomer. Can I send some of your, uh, my students to your research group, one or two students? Um, the other connection was Sandy's husband, Andy, who works in, in law in San Jose, you know, in sort of um, property law. Uh, his firm was retained by the Harker School, uh, 
often schools will retain law firms. Uh, and uh, this with these two connections to the Faber family. Anyway, Anita Chetty's emails to Sandy Faber had gone unanswered until um, my wife happened to go to the school and was giving, doing an outreach talk on, you know, on the behalf of NASA. And when she was having lunch with Anita Chetty, she mentioned Santa Cruz and she ratted me out and Anita started emailing me. And I went to Sandy and said, Sandy, this is someone who claims to know you. And Sandy says, yes, I know who this person is. I've been too busy, but you should do this. Uh, it, you know, sounds like a good opportunity. So that summer, 2009, three students came to work with me and this program got started. So what, what is this program? This program, uh, the essence of the program is critical thinking. That's what we're encouraging high school students to do. Think critically in the context of open-ended uh, research projects where you have close mentoring by um, a PhD student or postdoc or faculty at UC Santa Cruz. Um, it's eight weeks long. It runs for the um, summer and um, high school students come in and uh, there's mentoring by, um, as I said, PhD students, sometimes undergraduates, professors, uh, postdocs, research staff. But the important thing is the projects are real. You know, so if the, if the researcher needs something done over the summer or they're planning to do something over the summer, this is a question of carving out a piece, outsourcing it to a bunch of high school students, not really outsourcing because you're gonna train them to do this and then have them do the work. Um, so this is the essence of it. And, um, and it started out in astronomy, but now it's across all academic divisions on the UCSC campus. Humanities, social sciences, arts, physical biological sciences, which is the uh, division astronomy is in, and the Baskin School of Engineering. Um, these 21 projects, uh, 21 areas, programs, initiatives on the UCSC campus have been represented in SIP. Not all of them are represented every year. For example, in 2021, so far, as, as we can tell, the economics is not being offered, and microbiology and metox is not being offered this summer. So it's 19 of the uh, areas being offered this summer. But in past summers, we've, last summer we had talks a few years ago, we had econ, we, but we didn't have sociology last year. We didn't have Latin American and Latino studies last year. Um, we didn't have art, culture and STEM, a wonderful intersectional area that uh, we have this year. So it's really grown well beyond astronomy. And for every project uh, on our website, you can see that there's a description. Sort of uh, this, this came from David Williams in the physics department. He posted under ASD, under astronomy astrophysics. But the first paragraph sort of talks about why, you know, why do this project at all? And the second um, paragraph talks about the specific tasks the students would carry out. And then you say something about the schedule and what skills the uh, students should have and what skills they're gonna sharpen over this summer. Uh, anyway. So long story short, we started with one school in 2009 with three students. Um, since then, in the 12 years since then, I'm not counting 2021 because we don't yet know what our final roster of students will be, but there's been 202 high school students represented from, you know, from, mostly from the Bay Area, but from school, schools from other parts of California, other parts of the country, other parts of the, uh, other parts of the world. And we built up these wonderful partnerships with schools that serve at-risk students and um, so we built up this trust and partnership with, a, with about 20 schools and after-school organizations. One of the biggest ones is College Track. Uh, another one is Peninsula Bridge. And a third one is called Minds Matter, Minds Matter San Francisco. And they're different, uh, you know, uh, one, of some, one of these organizations is really focused on first-gen students. Another one is focused on um, you know, students of color. A third one is focused on low-income students. Um, so uh, there's been uh, nearly 1,200 cases of students participating, but 1010 different students because students come back for uh, multiple summers. There have been 182 instances of that. And in the 12 years, this program has grown. It's grown like this. It's grown from three students in 2009 from one school to last summer, we had 225. And this summer, we expect to have close to 300 students. So it's really been growing. And, um, you know, this upward spike, from 180 to 225 to 300 in the between 2019 and 2021 is a direct result of COVID-19. The program is being offered completely online and that opens up access in a way that an in-person program uh, hadn't. So we are determined going forward, we'll have a significant in-person component once things clear, but we'll have an even more significant, even bigger online component than uh, the in-person component uh, going forward in SIP. 
These are the 202 high schools. Um, I love looking at this because uh, red means international. Blue means outside the state of California, but within the US. And italics means uh, private school. Roman font means public school. So that's just sort of one of the ways in which you can slice and dice this list. But um, it really is an amazing list of high schools from all over. This does not include 2021. It's the first 12 years of the program. Um, I'd like to say we've had a gender imbalance in the program. Every there have been more, uh, you know, more students who identify as female than students who identify as male. Every year in the program, except for the first year, uh, the three students there were two boys and one girl that first year. Ever since then, um, the balance has been in the other direction. And um, and there's been a very strong focus through partnerships and um, other recruitment, uh, students who faced serious societal obstacles. Um, the, I, you know, I've, I've listed categories here, but you know, it's uh, this is it's much more complex than that, right? This doesn't even begin to capture um, obstacles that um, students face. Um, we have an, a, a fantastic scholarship program. We've had wonderful support from uh, from people all around, um, you know, the Bay Area. Google has become a big supporter. So has Amazon. You know, they give us. Um, you know, corporate donations, we've had individual donors. It's about a million dollar program. It's a nonprofit program, but the overall budget is a little over a million dollars. That's how much money comes in, uh, in terms of program fees and donations. Uh, program fees only from families can afford it. About a third of our students are on need-based scholarships. And, um, but, you know, you might wonder where does this money go? You know, where does a million dollars go? About 40% of that goes to graduate students on the campus to pay for um, you know, part of their summer stipend. So uh, SIP offers a stipend to mentors. And so this is where a lot of this money is going. And you know, in astronomy, that, that may not mean very much. Uh, you know, th $300,000 um, uh, is a lot of money, but uh, three, three $400,000 is a lot of money. It, most of it goes outside astronomy. Uh, oops, oops. Oops, I don't know why, but um, can you still see my screen? Can people still see my screen? Sorry. Something yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, something rebooted on my, something something drastic happened on my computer, but it didn't affect PowerPoint. Okay, so um, anyway, so this, uh, there's been a lot of corporate and individual support for this program, and it wouldn't have grown without it. You know, in fact, I was on sabbatical at Google six years ago and to really help build this program, they provided me the space the money to do this. Um, you know, we, we, of course, thought a lot about whether, you know, how, what kind of impact this, this kind of engagement is having on, on students. So a few years ago, um, a couple of psychology researchers, uh, Professor Cam Leeper was the chair of psychology for years, uh, for many years before stepping down recently, his PhD student, Christy Starr, and he were SIP mentors. They would take on students, uh, high school students and mentor them on research projects. But their area of research is looking at what factors affect students' sense of belonging in STEM. That is their area of research. So they decided to do something fairly reflexive, which is to say, we will have our students work on SIP data. We want to understand how the SIP program is affecting students' sense of belonging in, uh, in STEM. And they found that, um, you know, this is, they were using, you know, methods that professional psychologists use uh, in, in their academic research. And they saw uh, increase in STEM interest, increase in STEM confidence. And they, they found that, um, you know, this was especially prominent in, in students who, um, you know, uh, room to grow, students who are, uh, who are more likely to be from historically excluded backgrounds. Um, and uh, they identified factors, um, you know, obviously participation rather than observing was one of the key factors that caused these increases in interest and confidence, but also feeling recognized as a scientist, being asked by the mentor, what do you think of this plot or what, what is this telling us? These were important factors. Um, this is actually the last of my content slides. My, you know, I wanted to end by reminding you of these three uh, initiatives. And I can tell you that the first collaboration I've said this to Annette many times, uh, is the most significant collaboration I've been involved in uh, in my 35 years as, a, as an astronomer. So I'll stop here and I'd love to hear questions. I'd love to um, encourage people to, um, you know, um, to think about whether they'd like to participate and how they'd like to participate. So I'll 
I'm sharing my screen so we can look at each one another. And I see something in a chat, so let me go there. Oh, okay. Thanks, Harry. Um, and David, uh, David Williams is here. David has been a, a mentor in SIP. So David, if you'd um, feel free to speak up. Amanda, you've been a um, mentor in SIP. Martin, you've been a mentor in SIP mm. for years. Um, so um, anything you'd like to add? You think has been a mentor in, in the SIP program. Um, you know, I'm obviously giving you a highly biased perspective. This is my baby, uh, this program is. And, uh, but floor's open for questions, please. Questions and rotten vegetables are both gleefully accepted. <laughs> Roger, I, I've, I've got a, a, a rather simple que SIP question, but might, might not have a simple answer. Uh, are we going to be able to get some kind of in-person component this summer? Uh, very unlikely. We're not planning for any in-person component just because of, um, I guess, uh, state, county, UC, and campus restrictions. Uh, it takes quite a bit of planning to get housing and transportation in place. We are not planning on it. And Christy can speak to this. Christy is my one of my SIP colleagues. Um, we are um, we had hoped we might be able to pivot and include a small in-person component. It's not looking likely. It is really not looking likely. Uh, Christy, did you want to say anything about that? And I, I, uh, Elizabeth, I, I, I see your hands up. Christy, did you want to chime in with um, uh, any, any, uh, in response to Martin's question? And Martin, in response to your question, Raj is exactly right. We're just following campus protocol, and it's looking like we will be virtual for 2021, but we'll be back in person for 2022. So. We're really looking forward to that. So, Part, Elizabeth, and partly in person. Sorry, I was just going to say partly. In, we we want to maintain an on, on in online component. Sorry, go ahead, Christy. Elizabeth, I see you have a question. Um, yeah. Um, well, thanks. Um, that was a really great talk. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I was wondering your thoughts um, regarding this idea of like. Um, uh like having a research project that you work a student through um that already exists i thought that was a really interesting idea i'm curious to hear your thoughts on the question of like so like there's one mindset of like one of the main things that we want to do is like try to populate the actual like like professor ranks basically of like people it, like people to have power in like astronomy and, and stuff and to have like the most efficient way of doing that so that people can just have an equitable field all the way through. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like the benefits of, of having this type of project that a student works on um, for many people, as opposed to having a smaller number of people work on projects because um, coming from the American um, like system of like secondary school to, to college and stuff like, it, I have noticed that it is actually at this point um, starting to be necessary for graduate admissions to have like a freaking published paper in academia. It's that wild of competition. I'm wondering, are these students benefiting from this? And it seems like clearly they are, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. And thank you for, sorry, it's kind of a long question, complicated. No, oh, that's a great question, Elizabeth. That's a great question. I don't have a simple answer to this. I can give you a personal take on this, but I don't, there's no simple answer to this. Uh, uh, my personal take on this is we are trying to treat, uh, we are not trying to teach astronomy when we bring a student into an astronomy project, we're trying to teach critical thinking. Um, we want that to happen along You're the way. About to head back over the hill. Oh, so yeah, we, we want, so we, yeah, we want the, uh, I see critical thinking or practicing critical thinking in a real world context as the essence of this program. Um, we, um, you know, the, the job market in astronomy is already very full. I, I, you know, it would be unfair to say to these students, you're all gonna become astronomy professors one day. That's not the goal at all. In fact, what we see a lot is people become enamored of the techniques more than the, the, the discipline in which it's being applied. And one sign I see of that is um, a disproportionate number of our students go on to computer science and computer engineering majors in college. Uh, you know, even if they've used computing to tackle, say, a problem in linguistics or 
astronomy or economics, they find themselves wanting to build that skill. They see the power in that technical capability. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but I mean, I think the technical skill is a second piece. I mean, critical thinking is not just about technical skills. I mean, we've seen from everything, including the politics of, uh, of, of the country that critical thinking is, uh, you know, uh, is in short supply. It's something that, uh, you know, would be nice for it to be more widespread. I think that's a really interesting answer, and I don't know if it answers the question, but I think the question is an extremely complicated and difficult one, so I really appreciate that. And I guess I have like a follow up question, which is like, when you talk about like critical thinking skills, like I think I definitely agree with you and I understand what you mean when you say that, because I think there's definitely a set of skills that's like critical thinking skills that are really useful to have, whether you're a scientist in academia or a data scientist or what, but, um, and just to be generally employable. But at the same time, I'm not sure how to really say that concept because I feel like, like people have a lot of critical thinking skills just like from from living their lives like true and so true. i don't know if that like is there a better way to phrase that potentially or i don't really know what my question is but well, this is a good question you. for the whole group i mean i i think of i think of critical thinking as being um trying to navigate the gray nature of information you know um you know facts are not in facts and fiction are not in black and white they're not and trying to navigate that the the very large gray um, is um, is the thing I think of uh, when I'm when I'm thinking of this. But you know, each of you has your personal experience with critical thinking, and I'd love to hear other perspectives. Thank you. Roger, it's Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Um, I want to expand a little bit on the comment you made about um, not everyone is training to become a professor of astronomy. And that's a little, some might interpret that as a little bit negative, especially if you're in graduate school earning a PhD in astronomy. But we don't really need a lot more professors of astronomy. That is, society doesn't benefit if we doubled or tripled that number, but society really benefits if we create people who can teach others about cause and effect. And that's what I think about critical thinking uh, is that it's simply understanding cause and effect. And a derivative of that, for example, is that people who have studied cause and effect in some discipline more than I have are called an expert. And the reason they're called an expert is because they know more than me and their theory is far more likely to be right than my theory. And that's what's uh, drastically uh, lacking in Western cultures today, which is just this simple appreciation of cause and effect and what's an expert. And the only way we can conquer that is by education. And so the educators that we need are not PhD astronomers, but they're people who can articulate such issues as cause and effect. And of course, graduate training in astronomy is one way to get that, but there are many, many other ways to get that same thing. I just want to give a shout out to Cesar who just joined, because Cesar was, um, has been um, quite involved in the mentoring for the Python and research tutorial. And in fact, thanks to him, there's been a huge spike in interest in the University of Costa Rica. Among undergraduates, right, yeah, I got disconnected at the beginning, so yeah, it was. It's been a pleasure, and hopefully, I can contribute even more in the future. Oh, thank you, thank you, Susan. Um, by the way, Roger, I noticed that uh, with some pride, my high school of sixty years ago was on your list of remote participants this year. <laughs> Tell me which one that is, Bruce. Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. Uh -huh. So we have actually, a, we have a partnership with them. There's a project called the Baltimore Ingenuity Project. It's called the Ingenuity Project. And it's, uh, it's really um, about getting students of color involved in, um, in SIP. And we had a student last year, Daphne Waller. Um, she um, um, went to that uh, institute, but she's also part of the Ingenuity Project. And, um, and she is um, um, 
Yeah, she, she did this remotely, uh, but um, I, I don't remember exactly what project she worked on. She didn't work on an astronomy project, but um, um, and yeah, and, and, you know, she's African. She's part African American, part uh, part indigenous, uh, part Native American. So, so. Well, I was the class of 1964, and in those days, high schools in Baltimore were segregated by gender. So it was an all boys school then. Wow. I have actually been to the school, Bruce. I've been to the school to meet the Ingenuity Project because their office is located within the school. Um, so uh, when I was on sabbatical in Baltimore, I, uh, I visited them a couple of times. Small world. Small world. <laughs> I bet you haven't been to my school. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> it was founded in 1836. No, and I, uh, I you know I've said this before to the uh, SIP mentors here, um, like uh, Yuting has heard me say this, and. And, and Martin has heard me say this, you know, the, the mentors in the program are the lifeblood of this program. And Annette has just joined. Annette, welcome. I, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I told folks here about your wonderful Native Sky Watchers uh, project. Would you, would you like to take a few minutes to uh, introduce yourself? Throwing you into the deep end here. Hello, Mitakri Ariasen to everyone, to all my relatives. My name's Annette Lee. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the land we call Mani Sota Makoche, uh, the land where the water reflects the sky, or Minnesota, U.S. Uh, I'm here with our um, relatives, Ojibwe and Dakota, my communities, and I'm here with a good heart. So I'm happy to support uh, whatever Raja was already saying because I enjoy every minute of collaborating with him. So thank you for um, letting me jump onto your Zoom meeting here. How was your faculty meeting? I bet that was a lot of fun. <laughs> of course. And Annette, um, thank you uh, also for connecting, reconnecting me um, with, um, you know, Charita uh, on the you know, Skywatchers project and, and uh, another connection you've made with Andrea. Uh, Medina is really proving to be a, a you know, gold mine, absolute gold mine. We're working very hard together on this. So thank you. Um, um, Annette, did you, um, so I know that you are, um, you know, we are getting ready to um, get students involved in uh, on Nights on the Telescope later in April and in May. Um, uh, you've had some personal experience with this now. I'd love to hear your just a quick perspective on what it meant for the students who took part in this. What did they uh, go away with? Oh, there's a lot of layers to it that are very empowering. And it's sort of a, a celebrity status type opportunity that's just fallen in out of the sky. And students are, um, and teachers, educators, are amazed. Um, I think in terms of the um, eavesdropping on the astronomer, the pajama party, it's something so far out of their norm, what would regularly be, you know, something they would have access uh, to um, that, you know, just that in itself is it's something, an adventure. And I think in a way you might think, oh, during COVID, everything's so chaotic. How could anyone have time to do something outside the box? But I think that, that, that in a way it couldn't be a better time because there are so many kids falling through the cracks, especially our indigenous kids, our brown and black kids, our students of color, that to say at this worst of time, we honor you, we're gonna give you this gift, this opportunity, this pathway to be a part of something incredible, this high level research, you're gonna to get to peek in on this astronomer, this surgeon in the middle of research and, and have this conversation. Um, it's an incredible opportunity. On top of that, for them to be able to create content, to be the producers in this art, culture, science project, um, that's incredibly empowering because, you know, for so long, their voices have not been elevated. Their voices have been um, dismissed or, you know, invisible. And so all of a sudden flipping, flipping the whose voice is heard and having indigenous students participate in creating their own indigenous content and telling their stories. 
it's incredibly powerful. And I think that's why we've had so much demand in such a short time. This has just exploded with, with interest and people just coming out of the woodwork wanting to jump on the bandwagon. Thank you, Annette. One of the schools you've connected me to, uh, and a school teacher, Barbara, is at the Volcano School on the Big Island in, in Hawaii. And the teacher and students really jumped at this opportunity. And it's really sad to say that those uh, students and those educators really have no access to Keck. They have no, at least the, that's the perception that this is on, this is a telescope on, you know, on our sacred mountain, but and on the same island, but we don't have access to it. So this is something that's going to be deeply meaningful for the students and educators. And, you know, of course, for us uh, researchers as well. Yeah, I thought I was really shocked when uh, the teacher, uh, Barbara, said that they had no opportunities because Imaloa Astronomy Center is right there. And I know they're doing really good work, but maybe they're more working more closely with the university or whatever. I just know that um, she was adamant about how the students are really suffering and and also that Hawaii is um, very, very low on the list of, you know, the best schools in the nation. I wasn't aware of that fact either. Um, so for both of those reasons and a, a very high percentage of Indigenous students um, at the Volcano School, and they are literally next door neighbors to the telescopes there at Keck. So. Well, her budget was shocking. The fact that she's given $400 uh, for the year for her whole classroom, that's her budget. Uh, the, the, you know, that, that alone tells a story. Right. Yeah, just really, she compares the teaching conditions there um, to where she was teaching previously, which was in Harlem in New York City. So, you know, she's saying she, that her, she herself as a teacher um, was really shocked uh, that it's really her job as an educator there is so low paying. Um, you know, it's good work, it's hard work, but it's more along the lines of like a service work or Peace Corps volunteer than it is, you know, really this uh, um, uh, valued position. But in spite of that, she is giving 200% because she sees the value in this project. And luckily, I think the really beautiful thing is when we work with um, schools, especially in that model, um, they're able to get uh, the resources right from the school. So it's it's a thing about being insiders and um, the community that's already there. So the network of you know, somebody's teaching uh, science and somebody else is teaching math and somebody else is teaching social studies and someone else is teaching dance or, or film, you know, and so you've kind of got those resource people there, but it's like they haven't had many opportunities or no opportunities to really connect all those uh, resources and the talents of the people at the school and really give this uh, unique kind of interdisciplinary project to the kids. Um, and I think that's what people are really responding to. In fact, Kate said that she had been waiting for uh, her whole life for this kind of opportunity, that this was exactly what the kids uh, and the teachers needed. Um, she was really, she is really excited. And I thank you. Um, I want to be respectful of the time. It is exactly three o'clock. So and I thank you for joining again. Thank you so much for joining. Your perspectives are, I've already said to the group that my collaboration with you is the most meaningful thing that's happened to me ever. So uh, <laughs> really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming to this. I'm going to, um, um, you know, we are, we are at the top of the hour. Happy to talk more uh, offline with people. Love that. Take care. Thank you, Raja. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Bye -bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very Take much. Care.